Well, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to see so many um, fond faces from the uh, past, present. And coming out at night's hard, so I appreciate the fact that you've not gone home to your televisions to watch uh, your favourite program, but have stayed a bit late uh, to hear about Bob. So let me tell you a little bit about Bob. Bob uh, is a 33-year-old married man. He was married um, five years ago and was celebrating his fifth wedding anniversary in Darwin. Uh, when he, he was uh, he, uh, uh, struck by lightning. Now, I didn't know this, but 24,000 people um, die of lightning every year, and your lifetime risk of getting struck by lightning is surprisingly high. It's one in 13,000. So Flavio has always told me to go inside when the lightning's striking, and I've never <laughs> paid any attention to it, but from now on I'm going to pay attention to what she says, at least about lightning. So, so uh, Bob survived, but his husband um, died. And it was about a year later, after a substantial period of grieving, that his sister introduced him to a uh, new man at a dinner party. And after the third date, uh, they had sex and the condom broke. Now, this was the first partner that he'd had um, since his husband has died. And he developed a, a primary shanker. And so the question I have for you is, um, Who's to blame? Whose fault is it that, uh, that Bob got syphilis? So these are quotes, individual personal responsibility from some of the politicians in Canberra. And it's a big theme um, for some people. Uh, and the trouble with personal responsibility is the implication is that it has an association of blame. So if you're personally responsible for something, it's your fault. If you look at the definition of personal responsibility, it's the idea that human beings choose, instigate or otherwise cause their own actions and therefore are at fault for what happens to them. Now that same concept was uh, common back about 100 years ago in the previous century and this is a poster from STI control back in the 1940s and the doctor there is handing to the patient a piece of paper and you can see don't fool yourself you're to blame. So back in the early part of last century, the thought process would be that it was indeed Bob's fault that he caused syphilis. <coughs> so um, that brings this issue of, of blame and responsible. And, and the trouble is that that's quite destructive. Those, those emotions aren't helpful. What's, what's important is to frame that question in the 21st century and let's ask a different question. Let, let's ask the question, what are the main causes of Bob getting syphilis? Now, Bob had to have sex to catch syphilis. But, but the other thing is the person with whom Bob had to have sex with, had sex with, had to also have syphilis. So those two things had to occur. So let's look at uh, one night in Melbourne. Okay? So one night in Melbourne, about 500 men have sex with other new male partners and this year, uh, their chance of catching syphilis is about 1 in 150. Now, in Melbourne that same night, 16,000 heterosexuals had a new partner and no one caught syphilis. In fact, over an entire week, only one or two people caught syphilis. And the risk of catching syphilis if you're a heterosexual and have sex with a new partner is about 1 in 50,000 in Melbourne. So the risk of catching syphilis per partner is 330 times higher if you're a gay man than if you're a heterosexual. Now, so one reason that Bob caught syphilis was only because he was a gay man. That wasn't his choice. No more was it my choice to have green eyes or be my particular height. So, what if it was 2003 rather than 2019? Well, in 2003, 500 men had sex with new male partners last night and one in seven caught syphilis. So the rate was about one in three and a half thousand. So we'll compare that now to 2019, where the rate's about one in 150. <coughs> so you can see, if you had sex with someone in 2019, compared to 2003, you were 23 times more likely to catch syphilis than you were before. So one of the causes of Bob catching syphilis was having sex in 2009, when you probably should have had it in 2003, when he was about 12. Now, you'll see that the rate of syphilis has gone up a lot over that particular period of time. So the reason he got syphilis was because there's now lots more syphilis than there was back in 2003. And this wasn't a choice he made. He wasn't, 
He didn't choose to be of that age in 2019. So that brings us to the question of what determines the incidence of a sexually transmitted in infection in a population and that's what causes the high rate of syphilis. So we can work out what caused the high rate of syphilis, we can start to get to the bottom of this question. Now this is my favourite graph, it goes back to the early days of that particular posters and the views of some politicians today. He, you can see this is the rate of infectious syphilis in um, the UK over the last 90 years or so. Now it went up with the beginning of the war when all the 18 year olds didn't want to die virgins and so there were sex workers around and there was an increase in syphilis. But then you'll note it plummeted and if you look at the women there, the dotted graph, it went down to almost zero and it stayed there forever and hasn't really changed. It went up a little bit in men with the Woodstock generation, it dramatically fell with the HIV epidemic and it rose again with the increasing treatment. But the thing, you want, the thing I want you to notice is the dramatic fall that occurred with antibiotics. So if you try and work out what's the most powerful thing I can do, most powerful thing I can do to get rid of syphilis, it's to do something about getting treated. So penicillin is the single most powerful predictor of the incidence of syphilis in a population. Now, mathematically, we can determine the three things that determine the rate of a sexually transmitted infection in the population. It's the probability, per, per, pro, probability of transmission per sexual partnership. So if you use condoms, it's less likely than if you don't. It's the number of partners you have, the rate of partner change, it's the duration of infectiousness. And if you are able to have an environment where the reproductive rate is less than one, an infection will die out. If it's greater than one, you'll get an epidemic. I quite like aeroplanes, so I've used an aeroplane here as an example. This is gonorrhea in Melbourne in 2005. And I have put in this plane a whole lot of people with gonorrhea. And then I brought another 10 planes in full of people with gonorrhea. And I've landed them in Melbourne, I've asked them to go about their business. And you can see what happens if the reproductive rate is less than one, it just disappears. It doesn't matter how many cases come in because the reproductive rate's less than one, it will die out. In contrast, one single individual went into an indigenous population where the reproductive rate is greater than one and we got an epidemic. So the key is, how do we get the basic reproductive rate for an infection to be less than one? So the question you've got to ask is, so why is the reproductive rate higher in men of sex with men and why is it rising? What are the things that are driving that rate up? So you'll think of immediately, and most people do, well, it's about condom use and sexual practices. So let me take you through some of that information. So this is a graph from the gay periodic surveys that are carried out every year in every capital city in Australia. And they ask people about the casual partners they've had in the last six months and whether they use condoms or not. And you'll see there's been a very gradual, but really quite small decline in condom use over that time. So it's unlikely that that's a major contributor. Indeed, if it was just that, you see that um, men of sex with men use condoms more with casual partners than heterosexuals do from the Australian survey back in 2014. And you might say, well, it's drug use. You hear a lot about these people using different drugs. Drugs matter because drugs change sexual practices. Sexual acts last longer. People have more group sex and so forth. But you'll see down there the two drugs that really change sexual behaviour, which is speed and crystal meth, have been actually decreasing over time. So that can't be responsible for the increases in the rates of syphilis that we're seeing. What about the rate of partner change? Well, this has been studied extensively and, and um, on the same sort of surveys in lots of different capital cities and there is no evidence that the rate of partner change in men of sex with men is rising. With the caveat that the last 12 months or so there may have been some changes, but before that there haven't been. So that can't be responsible for the uh, exponential rises that we've seen in syphilis. There is something probably that has changed a lot and that's the way men find their partners. So traditionally it used to be, for example, at dinner parties or other things like that. But with these new apps, what happens is that you get a, a mathematical uh, event happening where high-risk individuals mix with high-risk individuals where that never happened before. 
and that has an exponential effect on the reproductive rate. So that probably has been playing a role. In fact, it's twice as likely that high risk mix it, uh, more recently than they did before. And it's true that, that gay men do have more sexual partners than heterosexuals, so that will play some role. That's why they have more partners. So there's very good data now that the negative effects on individuals of things like stigma increase their risk. So many, effects, many different things are affected by adverse stigma. And they include things like risky sexual behaviour, condom use, increased numbers of partners, and importantly, anonymous partners. And they also increases substance abuse. So, so the issue then is that that makes it more difficult for people to maintain long-term relationships because the downward pressure of stigma has on that. It's more difficult for people to access healthcare and get treatment. And it's much more difficult to notify other partners. So if someone has syphilis and they want to let their partner know, if the partner's been anonymous, they can't do that. All of those things magnify the effect. And I thought this film did it for me. This film explained the whole issue. So for those of you who are old like me, you would have enjoyed um, Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks in Sleepless in Seattle. It's a lovely love movie. Well, this is the equivalent. It's called Love, Simon. And it's an uh, uh, adolescent at school who's um, coming out. And he has this dream about coming out to his parents. And in fact, what, what happens in this dream is that all the heterosexuals have to come out to their parents, that they're heterosexual. And that's a mother there bawling her eyes out because her daughter's come out as, as heterosexual. But it gives you this idea about, about uh, stigma. So I'm going to summarise some of these issues before I move on to the next particular part. There's no evidence that the number of partners that uh, men are having with each other has gone up over time. There is evidence that there's, a, there's more mixing of high-risk individuals that will push up the reproductive rate. And there's very good evidence that stigma greatly increases risk. And we don't choose to be stigmatised. So, you may well ask though, well look, why don't you concentrate on condom use and partner number? Because that's, that's what everybody thinks makes a difference. Well, the first thing is you can't change partner number. It's just simply impossible to do. People have tried this by counselling and so forth. You might be able to in, a, in, a, in some sort of funny political regime, but by counselling you can't. They've done it lots and lots of times, they've done meta-analysis, you can't do it. So there's no point even going there to do anything about that. So what about condom use? You can, you can increase condom use, but it is expensive, it is hard to sustain, it wears off after about 12 months, and it's been well demonstrated. It's not a particularly effective control strategy. What about access to healthcare? What about access to healthcare? That infects, if it was the duration of infection. So here's my graph back again, and just look at the magnitude of that effect, the, the plummeting of syphilis, particularly in heterosexuals that occurred with the introduction of penicillin. Now this is a, a really important uh, mathematical model that, that illustrates two important points. So this is a mathematical model of gonorrhea in a population, and the dark line there, the top line, is the rate of gonorrhea in the population. And the bottom line, what they've done is increased a little bit health services. So you'll see in A, health services have gone up by 10% and gonorrhea has gone down a little bit. But when you get to 20%, something magical happens. You can see that it goes down to a very low level. Now the reason it's done that is you've overcome the reproductive rate of the infection. When you do it 30%, it goes down more quickly but not to a particularly lower level, and 50% it goes down more quickly again. But the thing that matters more than anything else is the amount of money you have to invest in health services when you have an infection under control at the end of the graph there is less than you need at the beginning. So once you've got an infection under control, it's cheaper to maintain it under control than it was when it wasn't under control in the first place. Now let's just talk a little bit about syphilis because healthcare is particularly important for syphilis. So syphilis, if zero on this graph is the infection point, the point at which people get infected. They have an incubation period of about three weeks and then they develop a primary chancre, a little ulcer. Lasts about 12 days or so. Then they have an asymptomatic period where they incubate secondary syphilis and they get secondary syphilis. So the symptoms begin at the yellow point. So if someone accesses healthcare there, then it will last for at maximum 12 days. 
if it, they miss the primary infection, either they don't go to the doctor, they can't get into the doctor, they feel uncomfortable getting into the doctor, it'll go either to the incubation period or the secondary disease and will last less than 166 days. And if that's missed, it'll last for a year or so. So you can see the huge magnitude of the difference between ensuring people get access to healthcare for the primary lesion versus missing the infection. So let's talk about how we're going with SDR control, shall we? How are we going with, with the access to services in Victoria? There's a smallish picture there of the fabulous team with whom I work, and they've been part of this transformation. So without additional funds, we've gone from about 15,000 consultations 20 years ago up to about 60,000 consultations now. Lots of hard work, lots of improved efficiency. You're actually greeted by a sign, go to the computer in the waiting room, don't come and talk to us. Just to save time so we can see more individuals. <coughs> and there's a blown up picture on the day we celebrated the marriage equality uh, vote in Australia. Unfortunately, we're not managing very well anymore. So this is the waiting time. People now have to wait more than 20 minutes to see a nurse to be told they can't, we can't see you today. That's the triage nurse. And when they get in, if they get in, then they no longer have to wait 30 minutes, which they had to 10 years ago. They now have to wait about an hour on average and sometimes a lot longer than that. But, so I'm going to show you three consecutive days that uh, happened in the last year or two. So this is how the clinic operates. Each of those lines up there are a clinic room and you drag the patients across into your particular square. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. All the people in red have been waiting for more than an hour. Many haven't been able to be seen. So we say, I tell you what, can't be seen today, come back tomorrow. Okay, so we'll go to Thursday, come back tomorrow, get into that long queue again, it's one o'clock in the afternoon it's, and people have been waiting since 10 o'clock, so we can't see you today, come again on Friday. These are three consecutive days. Come on Friday, I'm sorry, we can't see you today. You'll have to come back on Monday. Well, some people with a syphilitic shank, it's gone by then, so why bother? <laughs> I don't need to treat it anymore, I've cured myself. The infection will last for um, about 160 days or so. Unfortunately, demand has got so great for us at the service that we've had to put up this on our web page occasionally when it gets too busy. We're experiencing long wait. Um, and high demands, we may not be able to see you today. And occasionally, we had to go a little bit further than that and essentially shut the service and put a sign at the top of the stairs that says, I'm sorry, we're full. The waiting room is full, we can't see you anymore. <coughs> and that's in Chinese and Korean because we see a lot of international students. Melbourne has a Sydney, a single sexual health service. I would tell you it's the best sexual health service in Australia. It's certainly the largest sexual health service. It's one of the most efficient sexual health services, but it's only one. So Sydney has 10 sexual health services dotted around all the way from Westmead all the way in. And then dotted throughout the state of New South Wales, they have quite a lot more. So in fact, I think they have 37 services in all. Now the problem is also that not only do we only have the one service, but the number of cases that we're expected to see goes up. So that's the cases of syphilis that have occurred in uh, Victoria. And it's, ju it's just very difficult to manage under that particular pressure. So there's been a review of sexual health services and the, uh, the uh, outcome of that review is on the website and I'm not going to deal with that um, today. But I want to talk now about the consequences because there are consequences of inadequate sexual health services. So I, I think we're entering a new era. I think we're entering a new era of a, a sort of breakaway control. So this is the rate of syphilis by state, New South Wales and Victoria, and it's going up in both. But New South Wales has 50% more gay men than Victoria has, so do you expect them to have much more syphilis than we have? In fact, it's completely the reverse. So the graphs have broken apart now, and the rate of syphilis in Victoria is now 50% higher than it is in New South Wales. Unfortunately, this is translating also into some syphilis occurring in women. So there's the light graph there of Victoria and then of New South Wales as well. And you can see there's big increases in syphilis in women as well, which is in heterosexuals. Unfortunately, when you get women infected with syphilis and they're in the pregnant age group, you get congenital syphilis. Congenital syphilis is a condition that either causes a, a, um, a, a, a stillbirth or severe disabilities in a substantial proportion of the babies that are born. Now, unfortunately, uh, syphilis is 
widespread in Victoria now. This is the, the graph of the Victorian cases courtesy <coughs> of uh, Eric Cha, and it is widespread throughout the state. So I now think it's time to say, well, that's the situation. Those are the consequences of inadequate health care. I now want to talk about how um, other places are doing. And there's two issues here I want you to concentrate on. One is, are the total number of cases being controlled or are the cases being prevented from occurring in women? So this is a, the gold standard, if you like. It's Denmark, a fabulous country, lots of equality between individuals, accessible health services and so forth. And you'll see that they, re they saw the same initial increase that we did, but, but it's been able to be contained. And importantly, in the red, the women, or the blue heterosexual men, you're not getting transmission from that group into the other group. Where we are, it's being controlled very rapidly. In Europe in general, you are seeing rises in, in, in men, but you're not getting that breakaway phenomenon that I think we're beginning to uh, see now with heterosexual cases. So, so you might ask us, why is we getting this syphilis in heterosexual? So there's, there's, there's no doubt that, that uh, it has been some transmission from high risk individuals. Now that might be travellers or it might be other individuals where there's a fair bit around. But to me that's not quite the issue. The issue is are we seeing this breakaway group, are we seeing this breakaway occurring in heterosexuals and therefore we're seeing transmission of congenital, uh, cases of congenital syphilis occurring. So there's no doubt people travel more, you know, <laughs> in, in my day no one went overseas till they were 25, but nowadays most kids have been overseas a lot by the age of 25. So big increases in outgoing tourism and the peak age are just that age group that have lots of partner change. Lots of incoming tourists as well, again the peak age group, 20 to 30 years of age. And interestingly I think we're going to get more mixing between groups as well. This is the secondary student uh, survey that's done. There's 2002, 2008, 2014 and 2018. And the people are asked the question, people are different in their sexual attraction to other people, which best describes your feeling? And this graph is the percentage of individuals who say they're only attracted to the opposite sex. So it's gone from 95% in men down to 67%. It's gone from 91% down to 56%. I don't think the people have changed. I think younger people are experimenting more with those aspects of their life that they did in the past. This means there's likely to be more transmission between groups in the future. So I'm going to give you some other international examples that I think are really important about access to healthcare that, that highlight this particular point. So this is the rate of uh, HIV infection by race in women in the US. And the light colour is white women and the dark colour is black women. Now, you'll see that the rate is 1 to 2 per 100,000 in white women in the US and it's 30 per 100,000 in black women. The black women are not having more sexual partners than the white women. They're not using condoms differently to the white women. What is fueling this huge difference in HIV transmission is the people with whom they have sex with the, the black heterosexual men, have got much more untreated HIV infection because they haven't got the same access to HIV testing so they're not getting tested, they haven't got the same access to HIV treatment so they're not getting treated, and they've got much higher rates of sexually transmitted infections because they can't get them treated either, and so you get this explosive epidemic occurring out of limited access to healthcare. <coughs> the same thing's true in men of sex with men. So if you look at white men of sex with men in the US, they have a 9% lifetime risk of catching HIV infection. If you're a black uh, man who has sex with men in the United States, you have a 50% chance of acquiring HIV infection. They don't have more partners than the white men. They don't use condoms less than the white men. What's different is they have less access to healthcare for HIV testing, less access to HIV treatments if they turn out to be positive, and less PrEP. So the people that they're having sex with are much more likely to have transmissible HIV infection not because of more partners or condoms, but because of access to healthcare. So I want to clarify what I'm saying tonight, because I think it's important. I'm not saying that all the rises in STIs are due to inadequate STI services. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that adequate STI services are the single most important control measure. I'm saying that inadequate services will greatly increase STI rates. 
I'm saying stigma will greatly increase STO rates. And I know of no con particular control measure to reduce partners, or I suspect active anti-stigma programs will. And increasing condom use is good, but it's likely to be weak, it's likely to be expensive, and it's likely to be short-lived. So to rely on that is silly. So I think we're entering into a brave new era where our strongest STI control strategy is not working properly. So I'm going to use an important analogy at this time because I think it's somewhat relevant. So we love doing two things. We love having sex and we love eating. They're two of our most favourite things. That's why there's seven billion people or more, in fact, on the planet now. So let's go back to poor old Bob. Let's say he didn't get syphilis. Let's say just Bob is overweight. So some people, politicians perhaps, might say, Bob needs to take personal responsibility for his appetite. It's his fault he's overweight. Well, I would say that's a bit mean. It's very simplistic and it's really rather ignorant. So here's a graph of um, the proportion of uh, 18, or the proportion of all age groups who are overweight in Australia in two, in two cohorts. One was done in 1995 and one was done 13 years late in 2007, 2008. Now look at the 18 year olds. They have gone from 20% overweight to 50% overweight in 10 <coughs> years. Do you really think it's plausible that human beings have changed that much? that they are now so much weaker and so much less responsible than they were 10 or 12 years ago. Is that really a plausible explanation? No. If you want to change obesity, you have to change the obesogenic environment in which people live. You have to continue to intervene in schools, teachers about healthy eating. You have to regulate junk food advertising. You have to impose a sugar tax. Those are the sort of things that get rid of the obesogenic environment that cause the obesity. So if you've got an environment like this, delicious as they may well be, you'll end up with people being overweight. So people don't choose to live in obesogenic environments. Governments create them or permit them to exist. People don't choose to live in an environment with a high risk of STIs. Government neglect causes them. I think the public need to understand this because if they don't understand, then clinical services won't get funded. If clinical services don't get funded, the public will get more STIs. So the public, that is us, need to say to governments, protect me by funding STI services or prevention services properly and including clinical services as well. So let's go back to Bob. So whose fault was it that Bob got syphilis? Blame and fault have no place in this vocabulary. We should talk about what caused there to be so much syphilis around so that Bob caught it. Our politicians are responsible for the rise, not because they had sex with Bob, but because they didn't fund stronger control strategies. Perhaps we're responsible, perhaps I'm responsible, for not telling people loudly enough what we want, which is a low prevalence of STIs. But I can assure you, it was certainly not Bob's fault he got syphilis. Thank you.